Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hey everyone, welcome back to Journey Forward with Joy Rose. I am so looking forward to our conversation today with my guest, Andrea Owen. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us. I, I know even just from our pre-few moments chat, there's going to be so much that we're going to get to delve into, but please tell us a little bit about yourself and welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jory. I'm excited to be here. So just a little bit about myself. I'm an author, speaker, um, life coach, and I'm also a mom of two kids and an obsessed Peloton writer and also a little bit of a, a self-help obsessed junkie as well. Well, that's a lot there. I, okay. So right off the bat, just for fun, who's your favorite Peloton instructor? I I'm a little biased because I'm personal friends with Jess King and she was actually okay. on my podcast recently and I, you know, know her in real life and she's exactly how <laughs> she is in real life as she is on the bike. So yeah, it is Jess. Okay, perfect. I'll have to take some more of Jess's classes. I get I'm really I'm motivated by Cody Rigsby personally. I think he's just Always so much fun, which keeps me motivated. hundred <laughs> percent. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. So, okay. So right off the bat, we know you're one busy mama. You've mm -hmm. got a lot going on. You've got a new book that just came out, but I know we're going to get to the tips and tools and the things that you most share when you speak and when you are guiding others, but let's start with your journey. What's your story and how did you get to where you are? Yeah, I think like most people, I'm, you know, I'm 46. And once you get to this age, you have uh, several stories up your sleeve, but I think the one that really That's an understatement, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's quite a, a memoir in and of itself, but the, the one story that catapulted me to hear where I am now the most is probably, um, so I was married before I was with someone from the age of 17 and we got married when we were in our late twenties and had been married for a couple of years and were talking about conceiving our first child. We always knew we wanted kids and he had an affair with our neighbor and got her pregnant. And oh, wow. I was utterly devastated and also was very close to his family. You know, when you're with someone, I was, we were together for, you know, more than a decade and I was very close to his family. Yeah. And then I immediately got into another relationship, which was probably not the best idea. And he had terminal cancer and it was on again, off again, him sick for many, many months. And then at the end of that relationship, I started to get a little bit suspicious. Turns out he never had cancer. He had lied about it to cover up his drug addiction. And that same week I wow. found out I was pregnant with his child. And so um, it was my rock bottom moment. I still was legally married to my husband. <laughs> we were still like duking it out. Yeah. And it was a mess. My life was a mess. And I found myself literally in the fetal position on the floor of my bedroom on the phone with my sister and telling her what happened. And at, well, and at that point, my boyfriend who had faked cancer and had a drug problem had agreed to go to rehab because we were having this baby together. And, you know, some people get sober and they sure. turn their life around. So I wanted to give him another chance. And then he had um, a relationship with an addict that he met in rehab. And I found out from hacking into his email and finding the emails back and forth. And so he was cheating on me and we broke up. And so I'm on the phone with my sister crying and thinking like, how did I get here? You know, I was 31 yeah. at the time. I was just humiliated and ashamed of where I had ended up. And also thinking, I don't belong here. Like this isn't my destiny. Like this is, I can yeah. either use this as uh, just feeling sorry for myself forever and bitter and, and just, you know, take it as that, or I can use this as an invitation to really show up in my life. And the heavens didn't unfortunately open up and everything suddenly got better. It was a long journey, but, but I remember thinking I have to take responsibility for my life. I had ignored my mm -hmm. intuition. I had tolerated and even attracted these unhealthy relationships. So that was really what got me here. And that was 15 years ago. So yeah, my son just turned 14. Wow. Mm -hmm. Let me just say as, as a therapist, I am so in awe of your awareness, even in the moment to be able to say, what is my contribution to these patterns? That's yeah. huge, vulnerable, vulnerable, hard questions to ask ourselves because it's, it could have been Andrea so easy for you to stay 
in the externalization, in the blame, in the anger, and every other emotion I did that both, came with that. To be clear. <laughs> so understandably. And you were able to have the and, which I always say is so important, the and not the but, because mm-hmm. we, both are true, right? right? Both are exactly true. And you were able to see even in this mess, there's an invitation here. And I love that language. It was so beautiful the way you named that. I had an invitation here in how I could show up differently in my life. Yeah. So few, once you went from that, I had a few ahead. like little spiritual experiences during that whole time. And, and one of the things I love about that is I, a lot of people ask, like, should I keep my journals or should I throw them away? Some people burn them and have a ceremony or ritual. And I say you, you have to do whatever personally feels good to you. Right. I've always kept mine. And I'm so glad because I'm able to look back and like watch sort of the trajectory of my change and of my like consciousness and awareness Mm -hmm. and writing things down that my therapist told me. And, and also, I mean, I know that, you know, this as a therapist, there were things that my therapist had told me that I didn't listen (laughs) things about myself. Like she's, she's like, you have codependency. You should probably seek help for that. And I believed her, but I wasn't ready to take any action on it. So you can see in my journals, like the awareness of like, oh, she's right. And Mm -hmm. what do I need to do? Kind of like turning my head away from blaming, 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 and turning it towards, okay, like, well, what can I do to solve this problem and not make the same mistakes again? And that's the key because we get into these repetitious patterns Mm -hmm. and without awareness, we continue to attract them unknowingly, partly because they're familiar. They make sense to us. Totally. And you know, I was was not only codependent, I was not only codependent, but I was a love addict and I I didn't actually know that until, so I, my, my ex-boyfriend, um, the fake cancer guy (laughs) went to the meadows in Arizona (laughs) and I went for family week. And they were talking about love addiction and codependency. And I, I'm grateful to them that they introduced me to those topics and realized like, oh my gosh. And then I read a book on love addiction and was like, why is she spying on my life? <laughs> mm-hmm. So it was, it was insightful to not only understand what those look like, but to have that vulnerability and that um, trust in myself that. I needed to admit that this is what was going on and that I could, that I could change behaviors. So for those who are listening right now, who don't know what love addiction is in more of a technical sense, what would you describe the patterns was that was showing up that you became really aware of? Oh, wait, this is an actual thing. Yeah. My very non-clinical description. Um, (laughs) So how it manifested for me was that, and, and to my understanding, the book that helped me the most was Pia Melody's um, Facing Love Addiction. And she says, all love addicts are codependent, but not all codependents are love addicts. So, you know, codependence plays a, a very large role in our behaviors. And how it manifested for me was that I used men and relationships, sometimes sex, but more so um, love and the relationship as my higher power. I chased that Mm -hmm. as my source of self-esteem, as my source of validation, as my source of self-worth. And so it was a cycle and I would Mm -hmm. chase, chase, chase. And it, and I, I was unfaithful to my previous husband when we were younger. So I, I cold Turkey stopped cheating on him way before we got married. He, on the other hand, did not. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I wasn't a saint, but like, I know why I was doing it is because I wasn't getting my needs met in my relationship. I was feeling ashamed of where I was. I didn't like myself very much. So I would mm-hmm. go out and try to get this validation, this relief from men and from these short relationships. And then I would, you know, be unfaithful to him or, you know, sleep with someone on the first date, then feel terrible about it. I would feel like a piece of crap person and vow to never do it again. I mean, this sounds a lot like, like a chemical process addiction Sure. Um, and then need relief and then start the whole thing over again. That, that went on for years. So you're on the floor in the fetal position, talking to your sister, saying, what do I do? And you have this awareness and that's the big major first step. But then what? I mean, because we can have that awareness and not create the change and we can have the awareness and get so stuck in shame or judgment that we now are paralyzed. We can have that awareness and say, this just feels too big. Yeah. How did you take those actual next steps? Well, I, I thought all of those things that you said, you know, many times like this is too big. I, 
I remember sort of like cursing the gods and, and thinking like, wasn't it just easier to be unconscious and to like be a raging codependent <laughs> because I call it the point of no return. Like when you go in and you have that element of self-awareness, but you haven't made a whole lot of changes yet. Like you haven't taken a whole lot of action. And it partly for me, it was because I knew how difficult it was going to be to set right. boundaries, to say no to men that I weren't good, that I knew weren't good for me, even though they were gorgeous and funny and charming. Um, taking action also looked like um, setting boundaries, having hard conversations, feeling my feelings, you know, trauma therapy, all these things. I thought to myself, if I walk in there, like, I'm never going to stop crying. Like, <laughs> so to answer your question, I, I had to like sort of wade through all of that. And you know, that's such a good question. I'm not sure. I, I think part of it is just my personality is that I'm yeah. naturally optimistic, which I, I want to just be transparent because I know that that's not everybody's set point. Um, right. I, I also love being underestimated. And part of my motivation was showing my ex-husband that I was going to be let, fantastic. Like, let, watch. Me, let, me, let, let me have my success be the best revenge possible. My happiness, well, and, my new relationship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> your joy. Well, and you know, part of what I'm, you know, I'm guessing was part of your process. You didn't name it specifically. You alluded to it is the importance and the necessity to let it be okay to be uncomfortable. Yes. Right. I mean, whatever addiction is, you know, someone's engaging in, and in your case, it was love addiction. It's because we are seeking some release of what's uncomfortable because in the moment it's easier to believe I can find greater comfort in something that I conceptually know isn't good for me, but I'm going to have a lot of, you know, big dopamine dump on the front end. So it's going to be worth that high to chase. And yet what I'm really seeking is to not be uncomfortable. And yeah, you know, we want to change so the way we feel. And so much of the foundation of the work I do is in mindfulness, which is how can I sit with what's hard? How can I accept what I don't like? And, you know, people always say to me, but Jory, how do I, how do I accept what I don't like? If acceptance is the key to getting through the discomfort. And my response is, you don't have to like it to accept it. You just have to stop fighting it. And right. as soon as you stop fighting it, that's, that's partly the pathway through, Right. I think that's most of the pathway to like through, yeah. I, I, and I love your explanation of it. I love hearing different people put the words together for exactly what that process is. And yes, you, you named it. And, you know, it's funny as I was just having a conversation a few days ago with my husband and he and I have been married for a long time now. I met him actually when I was pregnant with my son and he legally adopted him. And then we have a daughter together. So it, we went through couples counseling where we did John Gottman's work about the four yeah. horsemen and I lean on contempt, which is terrible. I know. And he's a stonewaller. Um, and this was years ago. We learned about that and, and have learned to not do that anymore. And so we, we had a disagreement about something um, like over the weekend and we, I circled back with him later and we both apologized and worked it out. And I, we were making dinner together and I said, you know, I just want to acknowledge like how proud I am of us, you know, that we've come so far in our relationship and we both walked into the relationship pretty wounded and we've, we've just healed ourselves, you know, you know, individually and as a couple. And, and I said, I I'm proud of myself that I no longer have the trigger of um, when, like when we would have disagreements, I would immediately think like he's leaving me because my wound mm. for sure is abandonment. And Which would make sense me. with the love addiction, right? right. That you're chasing it. <laughs> yeah. He's going to leave. He's going to divorce me. I'm so hard to be married to. Like this is happening again. And I would immediately drop into that place before. And he being a stonewaller is, is he would just sort of run away and avoid me and sometimes not talk to me for two days. And I said, um, I'm just really proud that, you know, when we had that disagreement, I had to go run an errand that I didn't think that anymore. I, I knew mm. and was... I trusted us enough that we're going to work it out. This sucks right now, but we're going to work it out. And he told me, he said, this is my point. He said, I still, he's like, when we get in disagreements, I still have that pull to run away and not talk to you for two days. But I know now that it is way easier to just have the conversation and rip the bandaid mm -hmm. off and apologize if I need to. And then we get over it and then we make dinner yeah. together. And I was like, oh. I love us. <laughs> it's, it's such huge. an adult relationship. Yes, 
It's huge. And, you know, it, it's interesting. And this, I mean, we can go off on so many tangents on this. I, I love, I'm already so loving connecting with you because there's so many different ways we can continue to chat, you know, but in that dynamic, which I think is a, a very common one that I actually see with a lot of couples and that abandonment story is really common and the stonewalling is really common. And I hate to say it, but it kind of also falls under some gender lines, which I hate mm-hmm. over generalizations, but my personal observation and of my a lot practice, of them are true. It, yeah. <laughs> it tends to be true, but you know, it's interesting. So my fiance, he can do that too. And he's had a pattern of stonewalling and I've got the, the fear of abandonment. So it, it activates that trigger. Mm-hmm. And then through our deep conversations, and he's also a therapist. So we also have the language which is still makes it harder because we can't always put it into use easily, which bit really of hazard, pisses yeah. us off. <laughs> but what he's able to name, and this might be true in your case too, and for any of the listeners, sometimes the stonewalling is to protect, it's a self-protection mm-hmm. yeah. in so many different ways, but we don't see it as that. Yeah. And so, you know, whether it's love addiction or whether it's patterns in your marriage or even just in parenting, understanding the discomfort underneath is so powerful. And as I always say, there is always an emotion driving a behavior, Mm -hmm. but we tend to focus on the behaviors. But when we can pause temporarily and get super curious, like what's the emotion underneath this, it tends to dissolve a lot of the negative behaviors on its own. Cause then we can just kind of have compassion for, Hey, this is really uncomfortable. Can we just join together in this discomfort right now? Yeah. It's such hard work. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I want to say two quick things. Part of my point of telling that story is is to answer your previous question about how do you get to that point. And like, I wanted to use that example. It's because you have to just do the thing, like have the hard conversation in your marriage, like apologize to your friend or your coworker, your partner, your child. And then you start to build that self-trust of, oh, this is actually better because when we don't know, we don't trust it. You know what I mean? Like that fear of the discomfort is more than the, you know, the relief that we could get from the codependent behavior or the drinking the perceived, or whatever it The is. perceived discomfort, right? Exactly. The perceived so discomfort. It, it, it gave you working knowledge to know, oh, wait, you mean that's possible? Yeah. It, it, you, ha- you have to see it kind of for your own eyes, for lack of a better of expression of experiencing and the other thing I wanted to mention was that you were talking about feelings and um, and behaviors. Like one of the things that I teach my kids, because I didn't grow up like this, is that I tell them all the time since they were little, as I've told them, your feelings are never wrong. You are going to be mad at me. You're going to be, <laughs> you're going to have all these different feelings and they will, they're never wrong. And my goal is to never make you wrong for your feelings, but you are responsible for your behaviors that stem from yes. those feelings. And sometimes you need to clean it up. And so I hope that they... They have it memorized now. They're like, we know <laughs> when I repeat it, but like, and I love the saying, um, what is it? Your, your feelings are understandable and your behavior is unacceptable. Right. Because it's, it, it's oh, so many times I've thought that about people, like you can still be compassionate for their feelings and set a boundary. Absolutely. And ultimately, you know, to bring it full circle, these examples in relationships or parenting, this is what you likely did for yourself in those moments to really get unstuck from your own patterns, mm-hmm. right? Was to understand your own emotions were understandable and you could have compassion for those emotions. And you also wanted to stop the behaviors of love addiction and codependency. Yeah. It took me a long time to realize that because I'm, I'm a Gen Xer. I grew up in a, and I'm just generalizing here, but I, I grew up in a house where we didn't talk about feelings. Feelings don't solve problems. If you had any other feelings besides happiness, you just go do that in your room. And then you come out when you're done and you can join us. And I was always that kid who was like going to point out that the emperor had no clothes. Like I wanted to talk about hard things, but I didn't know how, and I didn't have the language and I felt like it was unsafe. So mm-hmm. now I kind of joke with my mom that like, I'm making up for lost time. <laughs> And I make people in my family very uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) So this is one of the challenges of growth is you now like, oh, I can help other people grow. And let's, you know, or maybe even if it's not intentionally, but, you know, when you know it's possible to get through these hard moments, you know, I'm not so longer scared of them, but other people are still going to be scared of them and Mm -hmm. they may not want to be doing the work, right? I have experienced that firsthand with, with people that I'm close to. It's, it's hard to be, yeah. um, cause you can't prescribe personal growth. No, no. So you just embody it and you just be it. And if they choose to want to say, I'll have what she's having, 
right? Then That's ideal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So where did your journey take you from there? So you, well, you mentioned you did meet your husband while you were pregnant, but at the same time, how did that, your personal journey overlap with what became a professional journey? So I decided, so originally I was going to be a therapist and, uh, my therapist, cause I, she'd been my therapist for years and she, she encouraged me to, she's like, I thought, I think you'd be, be great at it. Uh, and then I, I realized, you know what? I'm too cheerleadery. Like I, I, I had made up a story that you needed to be really, and honestly, at the time, I don't think it was for me. I would have had, had to do a lot of skill training with compassion because I didn't have a whole lot of patience or compassion for people. Like somebody would have had like clinical depression and I would have been like strategizing, like, let's get you out. You know? Yeah, no. So that's what brought me to coaching. And, uh, and it also ended up bringing me to Brene Brown's work and trained and certified and you know, and I'm doing shame work, which is heavier than I ever thought that I would end up. But um, it's, you know, it's kind of ironic. And I think the universe has a really great sense of humor that I didn't realize how much of my own personal work I would have to do when I went through coach training. I really Mm -hmm. thought it was just going to be, give me the skills. Uh, And it's the same with the training with Brene Brown's work. Like they had us, and I think this was by design. They had us simultaneously go through the work while they were training us to do it. And not everybody made it through. They, they asked some people to leave, which was heartbreaking. Wow. Um, yeah, just the, they needed more internal work, I think. But it, it, I didn't realize it was going to be so much of my own work. <laughs> I feel a little bit duped. Now. Yeah. But yeah, that's it. Was but that's life. probably one of the best assets you get to bring to your clients, right? I do think so. I, I'm incredibly grateful that, you know, whoever's in charge of bestowing consciousness, you know, cause I just don't think it's everyone's journey in, in this lifetime, you know, and the awareness and, uh, the ability that I have to now, and I haven't always been this way, but to have an open mind and to have an open heart and, and try my best to understand people's experiences, their lived experiences that are very often mm-hmm. different than mine. Um, I, I think that, it's, it's helped me as a helping prof- someone in the helping profession to be able to do my best to have empathy for people. Yeah. And, um, but I will say this too, side note, it has been helpful to grow up in a family where we didn't talk about our feelings because I can compartmentalize like a badass like <laughs> when needed. <laughs> <laughs> I can shut it all out and just be all business. So it has come in handy. <laughs> Thanks, mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, universe, for teaching me the lessons that I didn't know I really needed to know. I got Sometimes all of them. Come yeah. in useful. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about the Brene Brown work and working with the shame. This is something that comes up for a lot of people, and especially the clients that I work with, shame and judgment and that inner critic and that voice of the inner critic and the stories in which we tell ourselves. What were some of the biggest takeaways? Because I love Brene Brown's work. I think she's brilliant and, you know, prescribe a lot of her resources to the people Mm -hmm. I work with because there's so much value add in accessibility because it it it's not it's something we all need to yeah. some extent, right? I don't think any of us are immune from feeling challenges with um, vulnerability or you know, managing shame or getting curious. Like where did where did that come from, and how is it showing up now, and why am I still holding on to this old right. story or belief system? Well, her work, I think um, part of what I'm so grateful for is that she's she brought work that was already in existence to the mainstream uh, just by the way that she talks and tells stories and presents. And Mm -hmm. I started following her back in 2009 when her very first book had come out. And it was that book is kind of clinical. uh, But I mean, she used to respond to comments on her blog back then. and, And I remember her talking about how she got sober which is what prompted me to look into recovery. And I'll, I'll have 10 years next month, which kind of blows my Congratulations. mind. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and so when I first started my life coaching practice and got my certification and officially launched, and I worked with a lot of women specifically on the inner critic, because it's universal. And typically for women, it's, it's like the same kind of chatter that happens about not feeling good enough, like you don't measure up, the comparing. And I quickly learned that, you know, and I used the skills that I learned from my, from my coaching school and, um, and some books that I had read. And I quickly learned that there were some women where it wasn't working as well as it was with others. And I'm like, 
why is that? And I figured out that it was shame that that's what was really like kind of the underlying root. And so that was right around the time that um, Daring Way came out and that Brene rolled out her training and certification. And I jumped on it. I think I was in the second cohort and it was, I mean, let me tell you what, (laughs) she talks about the training sometimes in, in interviews and she talks about day two. Oh my gosh. I felt like they flipped me upside down and like shook all the change out of my pockets because I was like, I've been through 12 step programs. I've been to so much therapy. Like there's nothing else I need to, like, I'm not perfect, but like, there's nothing else I need to uncover. I was wrong. Um, it, it, my, t- to answer your question, uh, my takeaway was that we all have shame stories and yeah. we also, whether we know it or not, shame is driving a lot of our behaviors and decisions probably unconsciously. (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. and the better you can figure out what your shame triggers are, the better you can make your decisions and not fall into perfectionism and not fall into people pleasing because when we're doing that, I think it's a combination of shame. And for women, it's also the culture that we were raised in patriarchy. Yeah. Um, really drives a lot of us to try to be a certain way and to stay small, if you will. So yeah. that was a very long answer, but it's yeah, it's a kind of no, complicated concepts in some way. I, I think it's such brilliant work. And I've heard her talk about the day two. And mm-hmm. so I was curious, you know, what was your day two experience? And that's something that I, I think when we are able to be vulnerable as to uh, vulnerable enough to allow ourselves to be shaken upside down and let everything fall out. You know, it's, it's kind of like, then we can kintsugi ourselves back together. You know, what kintsugi is that, that Japanese art yes. of repair where the gold lines that cover the cracks. And because that is where so much of our beauty lies is in uncovering it and then allowing ourselves to heal from it versus pretending, Oh, there's no crack there. What are you talking about? Exactly. And do you want me to tell you like what the worst part of day two was? Like the exercise? Oh, please. I, I, I know you geek out I'm on so this. I'm so curious now. Yes. <laughs> so they, um, it's like exercise, like six or seven out of 12. And they, they sort of like dip our toes into shame a little bit. And we go through the physiology of it. So we're really getting to know what happens in our body, which is so important. And then there's one worksheet where we have to write about shame stories from our past, from childhood, from school, um, you know, whether it's elementary, middle, high school, college, anything in the work environment, anything from our family of origin, anything in our marriage. And then, so there's a group of like 10 or 12 of us, we get broken up into small groups and you're with this same group for the whole long weekend. And then they go around the room one by one and everyone shares something from their list that you share a shame story. So not only is it your turn to share it with people, but you have to sit and listen to 11 people's shame stories. And when I tell you, the energy in the room is, I mean, I'm getting used to it, even just like thinking about it. It is so uncomfortable and we're also being trained to, um, to empathize, you know, cause that's, and there was mostly therapists there. There was a handful of coaches and I think it was like one clergy person, but, um, even for the seasoned therapists, like some, some were more seasoned than others. You could tell, but it was difficult for everyone. And it's, and the fatigue the empathy oh, yeah. fatigue that, that happens, like it was exhausting. And Brene is not kidding when she says shame is a full shame and vulnerability are full contact emotions. We have yeah. physiological responses and it was brutal. Like that night wow. I went and got a gigantic hamburger and French fries from the hard rock um, cafe <laughs> restaurant and watched Jersey shore. I'm like, <laughs> and I don't even watch that show. regularly. Like, You're like, I am tuning out. I am, you know, going to the most shallow things I can find because this deep emotion bullshit is just too heavy <laughs> and just like have delicious comfort food and don't, I can't talk to anyone. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's intense. It is. And, and it's, and I, I think you probably understand, you know, as you have sat in the room, as people share like their deepest, darkest secrets. And so, you know, how, um, 
what a, what a gift it is to, to have someone share that with you and the, the deep listening that's required to show up for someone and how also I noticed how easily, because when I shared my story, I was making eye contact with a few of the people in my group. And one of the women broke eye contact with me very quickly, like made eye contact. Mm -hmm. And then she looked away and how that felt just that one little little micro expression of Uh judgment or, or her own discomfort, discomfort, right. Made me question everything. And I'm like, Oh my God, what have I done? And so luckily I, which is now a shame story in and of itself, right? Look at how easily then that gets triggered. So it was quite a learning experience. So uh, that's that was my takeaway. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. Just take that one lightly. Just got a burger and fries and watch some TV afterwards. It was a good yeah. day. <laughs> no, and I would do it again. And the, and the the people were amazing. And her her senior faculty is extraordinary. And um, but they were not messing around when they created that training <laughs> to make sure we I had bet. what it takes to facilitate that work. So now as you've incorporated all of this personal growth and healing and these trainings, what do you most love to do with your own clients? Like what is that sweet spot for you where you feel you are just in the zone Mm -hmm. in the clients you work with, which I'm sure are the things that helped inspire your book. Yeah. You know who my, my absolute like ideal client is, you know, I have a wide spectrum of people that read my books and listen to my podcast and they're all fantastic. And the ones that I work the best with are women who have some level of confidence so that they have self-awareness where they've probably done some trauma therapy and they, they know what their big triggers are and they can see them fairly quickly when they happen. So they don't get hung up by them and they they already have a fair amount of confidence and they've either climbed the corporate ladder or have, you know, like a good social group or whatever it is. And something is going on, whether they are too afraid to start their business or they're too afraid to try to get to the next level at work, or um, they're just, they're having a hard time, like in their interpersonal relationships, whether it's a partner or a, a friend or something like that. And they just need that extra push. Like I'm a really great mm-hmm. hype woman. Fantastic. And I also um, am good, good at sort of reading between the lines and and pointing out things, clients' blind spots that they might not know yes. is happening. A lot of my clients are afraid of their own. They're afraid of their own power and they're afraid of their own um, like possibilities. Yeah. Not fascinating. I think sometimes, you know, the people I work with too, I I see that often come up and I feel like sometimes it's almost a perceived curse of what if the things that I thought were possible come true? Well, now what do I do with that? If I've been stuck in this belief that these things can't happen and then they actually do begin to occur and I don't know how to receive it. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to harness it. Or maybe I can't internalize that I did something good enough to achieve it. Right. Right. And sometimes we even get in our own ways and can shut down our success because we don't know how to embrace it. We don't know, we don't have a working model for a wait. Right. What do I do when my story changes? I talk about that a decent amount and that whole fear of success. And I heard a man talking on a podcast about how he doesn't believe that the fear of success is really a thing. It's just the fear of failure kind of dressed up. And I disagree with that when it comes to women, mm-hmm. because I believe that for women, Completely. And I've, I've had that fear. And my inner dialogue is if I get this thing, then how am I going to sustain it? Mm -hmm. How am I going to, you know, we're supposed to top the year before, how am I going to beat quarter two? How am I going to, you know, sell more books with the next one? And then also the whole life balance, you know, work-life balance. How am I going to balance this with my kids? Am I not showing up enough to school functions? You know, if you're, if you're a parent, but I think that's where it's different for women than it is for men. So absolutely. We fear success. It's so fascinating. Well, and then there's the, Oh shit. If I succeed in this, what else in my life do I have to succeed at now? Because I know it's possible and that can be really overwhelming and that can stop people even there because they don't, it, it, it creates more work. It's like the awareness with the awareness comes the responsibility with the success comes the accountability. And Mm -hmm. that can be, that can be too big sometimes. I have been there, girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so have I. So your new book, Make Some Noise. Tell us a little bit about that. 
this is my new book, baby. Where is it? It's right. It's right here with a bunch of papers on top of it. Um, I just love the color. I'm, I'm just so I happy. I love that it matches cover. your nails too. I, I, so... I usually have, I'm a signature black. I'm a black nail polish woman. And I got these done specifically because the book just came out, but it's, uh, I've written two previous books and they're both women's empowerment. And this is a slight departure because I realized a few years ago that I could not write another book without talking about the culture that raised us. So I'm mm-hmm. obsessed with getting to the root of the problem. That's what mm-hmm. brought me to shame work because I saw that the inner critic was connected. And then I really started looking at behaviors like people pleasing, perfectionism, the imposter complex, overachieving. You know, these are a lot of the behaviors that that the women I work with use as coping mechanisms. Yeah. And they are in large part driven by the culture that raised us. And I just, I, you know, I love naming the elephant in the room. Like, let's just talk about it. And so, and it's not a feminist theory book. It's not to, you know, shake our fist at the patriarchy and flip tables and, you know, all men are trash. Like, I don't believe that it's really about, I just want the reader to get super curious about their life and ask themselves the question, you know, what is my conditioning and what is my truth? And, and when they hesitate to ask for more money at work, when they hesitate to raise their rates, if they're a service provider, when they're, when they hesitate to have a hard conversation to ask themselves, like, well, what's my conditioning around this? And that might give you some insight. Uh, I think it's such a brilliant question. And there's, there's so much wisdom to be found. We just get curious. Yeah. That's, and again, 250 questions in this book. Like I want people to learn how to coach themselves. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and, you know, from that place of curiosity, ideally, when we come from the place of curiosity with that kind of open awareness with it, simultaneously, we can help reduce judgment. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, as I always say, it's huge. And as I always say, judgment is the opposite of compassion. Compassion is one of the tools to get us unstuck. And judgment puts us right back into the spiral of being stuck. And curiosity is one of the ways where we can because the question of why people always ask, why is this happening? Why did he do this? Why is this not? Ha-? I mean, the why becomes such a sticking point for so many people. Mm-hmm. And yet, even in the question why, we can ask it from a place of judgment or shame or insecurity or fear. Desperation. Or we can ask why mm-hmm. from a place of pure curiosity, like even just shifting the tone of the question why puts you on a different trajectory of, of what you're seeking and the response. Absolutely. 100%. I agree with that. And, and even just if you can shift the, you know, like, why is he that way? You could ask yourself, like, what's important to him behaving differently? You know, what's important about that? And, or just sort of shifting the question around. Cause I've been in that place of desperation, you know, like wanting, wanting all the answers. And sometimes we don't know. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, I, I ask a lot of questions in here because I want the reader to hopefully move away from judgment and, and definitiveness, you know, assumption, because we make up stories all the time and move into curiosity and self-compassion. Yeah. And the, the hardest thing with that is a lot of times we may never know the answer. Right. So again, it kind of comes full circle of I can ask and I might not get the answer. So I'm like, can I be okay in the not knowing? But at least I've had the ability to be curious rather than making assumptions and or judgments or believing just what we were told or taught, right? So much. Yes. Yeah. I got the word surrender tattooed on my arm in my own handwriting a few years ago, mostly because of that, because like, I want to have all the answers and I I have to surrender to not knowing and not being in control. Uh, I, I can't wait to get your book. And it's, Andrew, you, I could talk to you for hours. There's so many more Same. things, but for people who want to get a hold of the book or learn more about the work you're doing, what's the best way to get in connection with you? So probably the website, andreaowen.com. And if, if they want the free workbook that accompanies this, because I ask so many questions, the people at the publisher were nice enough to make a beautiful downloadable workbook that you don't have to buy. And it's at andreaowen.com slash noise, and they can grab it there. All they need is a copy of the book, any format. And I have a podcast too, also called Make Some Noise. That's easy to remember. It's called The Same Thing. That's perfect. Well, we'll make sure to have that link in the show note, in the show notes. I can't even talk. In the show <laughs> notes. And uh, really congrats on the book. 
And thank you so much for sharing your journey and most importantly for being vulnerable with us because when we in, in the helping industry can role model vulnerability, it's easier for others to tap into theirs. So thank you for sharing your journey with us and for being here. And I look forward to hopefully one day continuing to more have conversation with you. Same. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for listening. All right, you guys take care and be well. To continue your journey forward, find Jory Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot com.